Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I very much regret uh, I haven't been able to attend the conference uh, so far, but um, I hope this policy panel adds extra value. So I think we have a very nice uh, range of perspectives on the panel. And uh, in the preparation for this panel, we, we asked the panel to take some combination of the following questions. Uh, one is the appropriate role for the counter-cyclical capital buffer. Uh, two is the what is needed for effective macroprudential regulation for banks and for non-banks. Uh, the third topic is the any possible interactions between monetary policy and macroprudential policy. Uh, and then the fourth dimension is, is the, you know, the analytics of cross-border spillovers um, of macroprudential policy. Uh, now, uh, I think uh, each of the panel members have, will, will uh, focus in on, on particular dimensions uh, of those questions. And I uh, will first of all uh, turn to Anil. So, Anil. Okay. Oh. I'm sorry, um, s seven minutes is, is the rule. Seven minutes? Yeah. yeah. You're going to regret those 11 slides, Vitor. Yeah, uh, I, I cannot. Yeah. You want to? Uh, yeah. yeah, I can do it from here. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for having me. And, uh, okay, so I did not coordinate with Jeremy, but my, uh, um, my message is going to sit well with what you just heard. So given that we've got seven minutes, I'm just going to try to make one point, which is let's walk through the thought experiment and, and just ask ourselves if we were lucky enough to ha have the crisis play out like it did last time, which I'm going to argue is probably not super representative, but just suppose we did, could we have used the CCYB, the countercyclical capital buffer, uh, to build up all the extra capital that we would have needed? And uh, I'm just going to lay out the argument by showing it's pretty straightforward to do a calculation about how much that would have required, ballpark. Let's look at what the indicators looked like when you were sitting there doing the, the job Kristen was talking about. Imagine you're the macro approved committee and this is what you're getting. And then let's think about whether it's realistic that you would have uh, done what it takes. Okay, so this is from a paper that uh, I and some colleagues, and I should say, I'm not speaking for the Bank of England here. So when Mark shows up uh, later today for Benoit's thing, you can't go running to them and say, cash up said the Bank of England. No, 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 no. This is just me. Um, so the, uh, the uh, paper I'm going to draw from here was something that I did with uh, some colleagues at the Bank of England, uh, trying to just look back at the last crisis and say, you know, could macro pru have worked? And uh, at the core of the macro pru uh, toolkit is this time varying uh, level of capital that's importantly a buffer that can be built up in good times and then released in bad. And uh, what we did in that paper was try to come up with an estimate of how much capital you would have needed. Now, this is not rocket science, but you can just look at the ex post outcomes and say that that would give you a sense. So if you were to say the turning point was the, the TARP, the uh, targeted asset uh, uh, purchases uh, that, that, that were done where they bought bank equity, the amount that was injected in the U.S. was about $200 billion. If you compare that to risk-weighted assets, um, that gets you a number, once you correct for the percentage of domestic risk-weighted assets, of, of about a 3% increase in capital. If you say, well, that wasn't really sufficient, the turning point was right after the stress test when we announced that the banks would have to go out and raise capital, they raised about uh, $70 billion right away, that would get you to a number that's more like 4.2%. Uh, if you decided instead that we're going to do a, a calculation that just said, let's keep the economy on its growth path and ask ourselves how much extra lending would you have thought had to be needed there, you get to a number like 4.7. So I'm going to take ballpark, a number somewhere between you know 4 and 5% is how much we, we would have needed. Okay, Now, turns out, David, along with some colleagues, uh, Aikman, uh, along with some colleagues at, at the Federal Reserve when he was visiting there, did uh, an exercise like this. And um, you should not be surprised that it's pretty challenging. We have this large literature on early warning signs 
that um, point out just how, how difficult it is to forecast crises. What they did was the kind of exercise that I think most central banks would tend to do, which is take uh, a bunch of financial indicators, locate the variables uh, in their own historical distribution. When they're at the high end of the distribution, you color it red. When they're the low end, you do green. And then just ask yourself what the distribution would have looked like for the United States. And one of the points they make is, depending on what exactly you're looking at and when you're looking at it, you'll get very different indicators as to how many things were flashing red. And, and one of the problems with all of this, of course, is that um, you know, you're, you're, you're probably not going to be sure. And the way that the countercyclical capital buffer works is to say, once you make a decision, banks have a year to raise the level of capital. We do that because we don't want them to have to go issue equity immediately. We want to allow them to essentially retain earnings, maybe cut dividends or slow dividends to, to build it up. But that means uh, what Jeremy was saying was all the more important. Even if Don Cohn had had it exactly right in 2004, what he did was, if, with the CCYB would only be enacted a year later. Okay? So imagine you're starting out at a resting point of 1% of or zero in the US, and then ask yourselves, how many bites at the apple are you going to have to get the CCYB up to four, and you're going to come away pretty pessimistic. Now, some of this thinking uh, informed discussions in the UK. So if you looked at the financial stability report that the, the BOE, that the financial policy put, put out yesterday, we changed the resting place for the CCYB in the UK from one to 2%, precisely so that you don't have to have you know, such a steep gradient. Now, even with a resting point of, of 2%, I still think it will be challenging. And I, I, I think there's three reasons why this is going to be hard. The first is, in most central banks, in most countries, a stress test is, is at the core of how you decide if you need more capital. Uh, there's a nice paper that Don and, and uh, Don Cohn and Nellie Lang wrote uh, last summer for a Fed uh, conference where they tried to see how is it that you can get a stress test to show you that you need a lot more capital. And what they point out is it's just very difficult to get these things to become particularly countercyclical. It's easy to see a gap, but to get the gaps to move around is, is pretty hard. Uh, the second thing is I think the last uh, crisis was a little uh, special in the sense that everything, you know, kind of was going wrong. There weren't any macro pro committees putting their feet on the brakes to slow down things. And so it's, it's almost certain that the next time around, you're not going to have a situation where every indicator is in the upper, you know, quartile of its, its distribution. Uh, you're probably going to have to have judgment. You're probably going to be in a situation where some things are flashing red and some aren't. And so, if you think about, okay, let's suppose we needed to get to 4% or, or you know, get, a, get 200 basis points more, it's going to involve taking some pro proactive decisions. And as Jeremy was talking about, that's not a, a bias that's built into the system. If anything, it's usually, well, let's wait one more quarter and see. And then the, the final thing is a, a shortage of theory, which is we still don't have a workhorse model um, that allows for multiple channels of instability. So if you think about most macro pro tools, they're either on the lender resilience side, where you try to build up the resilience of the, the banks and ideally the, the shadow banks as well, or you can get instability through the borrower side. Think about it, there's no baseline model that's used in every central bank where you've got both forms of instability in the model. So if you, were, if you were to try to do something like, uh, let's suppose we had a good model, we could simulate lots of times to just uh, understand its properties to get a sense of what would you have to do. Instead of just looking back at that one crisis, imagine I could run the world thousands of times and see you know, what, what's the constellation of risks is, is it going to look like. Well, we don't even have a model to do that. So um, for all these reasons, I think it, it's going to be difficult to get the CCYB to be super uh, proactive, and so I think setting it at a higher level is, is a good first step, but it, it's going to be challenging. Th thank you, Anil, and also for uh, being, being on time. So, uh, Vitor, over to you. Yes, thank you. I need the command. 
So uh, my intention was to address the first two questions that were put forward by the organizers, but I see that in seven minutes, uh, even the first one will be difficult <laughs> um, because I prepared 11 slides, so I will very likely skip the second point. Uh, and we'll talk uh, then first about the CC YB uh, and its use and possible effectiveness and how the policy problem now can be seen in Europe. Now, uh, if we look to the uh, situation where in, on, this is from the latest uh, uh, ECB financial stability review, showing that the very nice uh, systemic risk indicator that the ECB has developed since 18 uh, shows already some going up, uh, but in spite of that, you have on the right that the CCYB corresponds to the almost invisible red bar in the uh, capital situation of, of, of the banks. So, hardly used. Only seven countries have some CCYB, and some of them at 0 0.25 uh, basis points, I mean 25 basis points. So, uh, very low, uh, hardly used. Um, in spite of the fact that that would be now very helpful. Indeed, since uh, 17, just to give you an idea, there were discussions at technical level uh, suggesting that uh, uh, in Europe we should adopt the concept of a positive neutral level of CCYB in normal times. Uh, as the Bank of England did when they put at 1%. Uh, and that has many advantages, of course that I listed there. Uh, it helps to overcome recognition and implementation lags, helps against type 1 errors of missing coming prizes, makes it easier for the gradualism of completing the build-up. All that are advantages of having that neutral rate. That was very much rejected by most countries at the time. And now we see that uh, if indeed some slowdown is coming, it would have been very useful to start to build up something uh, earlier. And that's the policy problem that now uh, we have in Europe uh, 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 with this. Uh, especially now, it would be convenient because monetary policy is obviously constrained. So to have this tool uh, would be important. But to, to really have this tool would be to accept the idea that it would be useful to use it to release it when the crisis come. And that goes to the discussion about uh, capital uh, levels. If they should be higher, even when the crisis comes, they should be increased. Well, that would put into question this use of the CCYB. But my point uh, on this is the following. We should not look only for capital uh, ratios uh, of capital over risk-weighted assets or any other type, because after a crisis or during the crisis, banks increase sometimes their capital ratio just by deleveraging, because it's a ratio, uh, and not by increasing capital. So the indication from the Alan Taylor paper that saw that after the crisis there was a slight, very slight increase in the capital ratio may be just a result of the deleveraging that comes out uh, uh, after a crisis. So it's not, uh, uh, can be misleading. What is important, I think, is that uh, uh, when the crisis comes, the banks are very well capitalized. And then part of that is used as a shock absorber. And to be a shock absorber, it has to be admitted that it has to be released. It has to be admitted initially that the capital goes down on that part that is uh, contingent on, uh, on having a crisis or not. And then after that first moment, which is then helpful to avoid or mitigate the credit crunch, then it's time for recapitalization, but not uh, on the peak at the time of the crisis itself. And we don't have that uh, in Europe uh, right now. But there is a, a problem with CCYB, which is that many are skeptical about the use because they don't believe that will ever be any release of the uh, uh, CCYB. Why? For two reasons. First, micro-supervisors are against it, uh, deadly against it. They, uh, they say that if a crisis is coming, uh, or, or has come, then you need more capital, not less. So no release. Uh, and if you release, they will increase uh, pillar two uh, things. Um, and then it doesn't work. The other 
problem potentially is that markets may penalize in cost of funding if they see that in the crisis banks are indeed uh, going down in their capital. Although, if that is endorsed explicitly and publicly by the authorities, that can be, I think, overcome. So it's important to have this. But the reluctance of yeah. micro supervisors is a big problem. And we, have, we see this uh, in Europe, as I put there, that uh, whereas in the US, in the stress tests, in the adverse scenario, the threshold to have some action is in the tail risk, not that yet materialized, is say 5%. Uh, capital threshold, uh, common equity, in Europe is nine. Because if the banks come in the adverse scenario below nine, they are supposed to immediately increase capital. That shows the reluctance of using any concept of capital instruments to be released at the time uh, of the crisis. And these uncertainties are indeed another argument to be in favor of preferred borrowed based uh, methods of macro policy that don't face this uh, uncertainty. Uh, besides the fact that, uh, indeed, uh, uh, border-based uh, uh, measures can be more effective in mitigating the boom than just some increase of uh, capital, as the paper by Alan Taylor, Schularik, uh, 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 and Jarda shows, because it does not uh, really improve the probability of not having a crisis just to have more capital. Um, so it's not so much about mitigating the boom, it's uh, because borrowed base are more effective, but it could be very useful if there is something to release. And then there is this conflict, indeed, between micro and macro prudential, which is, I think, more acute than the conflict between monetary policy and macro prudential policy um, in, in, in some situations. Although, um, nevertheless, in the euro area, Within the limits of the competence of the ECB, it is clear that it is the governing council of the ECB that is in the lead in terms of macro prudential policy and should exert the arbitrage necessary between the two approaches and the two, uh, uh, and the two policies, where, where in the UK is even more easier because it's the best institutional setup to deal with the different instruments that the central bank has at its disposal. Uh, now, being this, this the uh, policy problem, then uh, uh, how to improve the situation? One thought came from uh, what the UK uh, begin, began to prepare, and also in the US. Uh, in the uh, September speech by Randall Quarles, there was this fine-tuning of a proposal that had been presented for discussion by the Fed in 2018, saying, well, let's create a concept, a new concept of a stress capital buffer that would include the conservation capital buffer, possibly some degree of a CCYB, if ever it is decided, uh, and, then, uh, and then the uh, uh, capital requirements coming from the stress tests, the CCAR, uh, which then would deal in the same uh, virtual buffer uh, both what comes from stress tests and what comes from other, uh, or from other origins. I have to, uh, yeah. Um, and then the, the initial proposal was this would have to be a minimum of 2.5, which corresponds to the conservation uh, capital buffer, which is no longer a buffer, or was never a buffer, perhaps. It's still written in Basel III that uh, the conservation, uh, the 2.5% of the capital conservation buffer, uh, and, uh, and I, I read it, uh, is there to ensure that banks build up capital buffers outside periods of stress, which can be drawn down as losses are incurred. No, the conservation uh, is not to be drawn down at all, um, which just on only shows this reluctance uh, of using uh, uh, the concept of buffers. So uh, uh, by putting a minimum of 3% in the proposal of uh, uh, quarrels in this speech, that would allow already the Fed to decide the 0.5 CCYB uh, within that new concept. In Europe, that could be achieved, say, by creating the same sort of virtual uh, new uh, uh, joint buffer of several things. In Europe, we could also add up the uh, systemic risk buffer to the uh, end, of course, very controversial, the uh, uh, pillar to guidance element. What happens in Europe is that there is a big uh, uh, pillar two uh, requirement plus a guidance, and that makes a big thing. And that's used across the board to all banks. There is a sort of minimum 1% that has to be there for all banks, whereas pillar two was supposed to be idiosyncratic according to the specific risks of each bank. 
That's not what is uh, being used for, is being used as a sort of margin of safety for the micro supervisors. Uh, that's uh, uh, how it is used. And then, of course, if it, that would be put into this more general concept of a, of a stress capital buffer, then that would allow now to decide an increase in uh, uh, the CCYB, increasing the amount that could be released when and if the crisis comes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vitor. Uh, next, uh, I turn to Alga. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. I will make uh, some comments also on the interaction between monetary policy and macroprudential policy, and my remarks are quite general, so I don't need slides. So, right. <laughs> um, But um, sort of the starting point of my premise would be uh, that it really depends on the source of the financial imbalance that might be building up, uh, whether or not monetary policy tools should be uh, used to lean against uh, such imbalance balances or whether indeed prudential tools, micro and um, indeed macro, are more likely to be effective. And I would argue that in the euro area, it's much more likely than elsewhere that the financial imbalance are either specific uh, to a sector, uh, to a market segment, or indeed an individual country because of the much more diverse nature of the financial system and more uh, diverse uh, cyclical uh, developments at the country level. Um, so you could argue that monetary policy therefore has a minor role to play only. But indeed, I think there is a heightened risk uh, that any financial imbalance, local uh, it might be, could become uh, systemic. And the reason is uh, the still incomplete architecture of uh, the economic and monetary union uh, that could mean that even sort of a relatively contained or containable financial risk actually starts to uh, blow through the financial system because we still have um, uh, no complete banking union and are also still doing work on the capital market union, and we clearly also don't have a sufficient fiscal backstop at this stage. Equally, I think it is clear that macroprudential policies are no panacea. Um, in fact, they could um, become another euro area coordination failure. Um, I think it's reassuring that the ECB has additional powers to add um, to uh, macroprudential measures, which we didn't have in the other um, elements where maybe Europe failed to coordinate, if you either think of the buildup of balance of payments and balances in the first 10 years of the euro, or more recently, maybe the imbalances that are building up on the fiscal policy side. Um, but it's not clear that it will be enough, because there are clearly material challenges um, that still remain. Um, we have subdued bank profitability, profitability. We still are working through some of the legacy issues of the euro crisis. We still have major obstacles to cross-border consolidation. And we're now facing uh, deeply negative uh, government bond yields, potentially for an extended period of time, which also have a corrosive effect. So why not use monetary policy then? Because it clearly, as Jeremy has coined, gets into all the cracks. I think the main problem in Europe is that monetary policy historically has been used to paper over all the cracks, um, especially um, in the uh, wake of the euro crisis. And as a result, the ECB is today left with limited ammunition to deliver on its primary objective, price stability. So I think that in the whole lean or clean debate, unfortunately, these, uh, the ECB most likely will be able to do neither. It's very, uh, I think, debatable on whether it could actually justify to lean against the wind in an environment where we're still far away from delivering on price stability and the December staff projections again showed um, that even at the end of 2022, uh, we're not really uh, where inflation should be. Uh, but also, um, if we sort of um, look ahead and sort of look at the ability of uh, the ECB potentially cleaning up uh, after the event, I think that might also be uh, quite questionable, uh, given the limited amount of monetary policy ammunition that is still left. 
So in my view, that means that in the next downturn or the next financial crisis, what we actually need is a coordinated effort, but it's a coordinated effort between monetary and fiscal policy, and I do think that prudential measures, macroprudential or micro, will probably um, have more of a side role uh, to play. Um, so um, what can the ECB do? Um, I think it might be worth um, thinking um, as to whether there is a place uh, to include uh, euro area wide macro financial dynamics uh, more broadly in what has been its much criticized second pillar in the monetary policy strategy. Um, so clearly it's more than just money and credit growth that needs to be looked at, but I do think that the upcoming strategy review would be a great opportunity to revamp part of this analysis and to integrate financial developments uh, much more obviously in mon into monetary policy deliberation to the extent that they're relevant for the euro area as a whole. So for instance, a broad-based financial conditions index that maybe reflects prices, sentiment, and uh, quantities. Uh, I'm still wondering, by the way, for any sort of smart reach researchers in the audience, um, on whether there is a elegant way to link uh, any FCI uh, to financial vulnerabilities using the area below the FCI as the key measure for financial vulnerabilities because it basically gives you a measure of the how easy financial conditions were and how long there were this easy, which I think is one of the key drivers of financial vulnerabilities. But anyway, so I think the upcoming strategy review is an important way um, to integrate this. And there is already some of this stuff happening. So just as an example, the ECB has done some work, and we have tried to replicate some of it and extend it further to basically include in any estimate of the equilibrium level of interest rate a concept of the financial cycle so that your equilibrium level of interest rates actually balances not just the economy at full employment and inflation at target, but also stabilize the financial system. And then as a result, if you either have major upward or downward movement in the system-wide leverage, uh, you would need to recalibrate your, uh, your measure of R star and your judgment of your monetary policy stance. So that, I think, would be one way how you can bring the macrofinancial uh, link into, uh, into the mainstream. But to sum up, I think uh, being able to debate the pros and cons to coordinate monetary policy and macroprudential policy unfortunately is not that relevant for the ECB at the current juncture. It's what you could flippantly call it would be a high quality problem to have. Um, unfortunately, the ECB at the current juncture can probably neither lean or clean, um, but that's of course because it had to do some serious cleanup work after the uh, global financial crisis and the euro crisis that followed, which makes it, I think, at the current juncture even more important that the prudential measures are delivering and making sure that uh, the monetary pol policy transmission mechanism is fully functional to take the remaining um, um, policy ammunition when it is needed. Uh, but I do think at the end of the day, it probably needs to be paired up with fiscal policy to work. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and then uh, f finally, uh, Jan, just let me get your slides here. Thank you, Philip. Um, what I thought I'd do is to uh, address the question on the link between uh, financial stability and monetary policy, but through the lens of capital markets, and uh, just uh, um, pose a couple of issues that have uh, cropped up recently. Um, imagine that you're in a, uh, within the border of country A, and there are some investors who are lending to some borrowers, and the color here is the currency. And um, uh, we know from some micro work, and here's the, uh, the Majoria et al. paper, that uh, uh, lenders tend to lend uh, in their own currency. So if they're lending to borrowers outside their jurisdiction, they tend to lend in their own currency, which means that uh, if there are some borrowers within that jurisdiction that are borrowing from foreigners, they tend to borrow in foreign currency. And, uh, but the exception is the U.S., where everything is in dollars, and, and here the color is green. Uh, and here is uh, one very interesting chart from, from, that, from their paper for Canada, uh, 
for Canadian corporate bond issuance. So the, uh, think of it like this. So horizontal axis is the domestic currency, foreign currency distinction. So if you're to the left, you tend to borrow in domestic currency, Canadian dollars. If you're to the right, you borrow in uh, foreign currency. The vertical axis is the internal-external distinction. Uh, are you borrowing from residents or non-residents? So if you're uh, close to the bottom, you're borrowing from residents. If you're uh, uh, up there on the top, you're borrowing from non-residents. And you see this uh, line just lining up exactly. So if you're borrowing in Canadian dollars, you tend to borrow from uh, Canadian residents. If you're, borrowing in, uh, if you're borrowing from foreigners, then you tend to borrow in foreign currency. Um, uh, but this is the US, where everyone borrows in their own currency, which is the US dollar. Now, why is this important? I think this is important because um, uh, when we think about the hedging demand for borrowers, um, you know, one way to understand this particular pattern is that the liability side of the lender really looms into view. So if you're a pension fund or a life insurance company in country A, your obligations are uh, to your domestic uh, uh, policyholders or, uh, or, um, or to the beneficiaries in your own currency. And so you tend to gravitate towards claims that are in your own currency. But of course, if you, if you can hedge, um, then you can convert that ex uh, exposure back into your own currency. And this is where the banks come in because the banks are the ones that provide most of these hedging services. Now, why is this important for uh, monetary policy. Well, um, the BIS recently published its triennial survey, and uh, the left-hand panel just giving is giving you a, a sense of the um, of the currency counterpart to the dollar. And the dollar is the dominant currency here. Ninety percent of swaps uh, tend to have the dollar on one side of the transaction, and uh, uh, these color schemes are vis-a-vis -vis the other major currencies. And then the gray is on uh, is vis-a-vis -vis the other currencies. And think of this as basically the amount that's being rolled over uh, in the swap market. So the amount that's been invested in dollar-denominated paper that would rather not be. Right? You would rather not be in dollars, but you have to because that's the most liquid market, that's the biggest market. And so you're hedging it back to your own currency. And most of it is actually very short term. So you're rolling it over uh, in a number of days rather than uh, holding it to term. And I'll come back to this shortly because this is going to be very important. And if we look at the IMF uh, CPIS, we see, for example, in Japan, when you look at the international portfolio, the blue is the, uh, uh, the amount that's held in US dollars. Uh, there's a bit in euros, uh, but the blue is the big, uh, is, is the big part. Here's Switzerland, where the euro part is bigger, uh, but the blue is, again, very large. Now, why is this relevant? Well, um, here's where the banks come in, and the banks have not been doing too well. They have been very subdued. If we look at the asset growth uh, pre and post crisis, um, what we see are these hockey stick diagrams where before the crisis, and these are in lock scale, so the slope is basically the annual growth of assets and the annual growth of book equity, which is the blue, we had uh, roughly 15% annual growth rate in assets and book equity. Uh, uh, on the left hand panel here for the US banks, uh, these are the the large US banks. But then after the crisis, we are flattening out. So uh, yes, assets are growing, but at a very subdued pace. Yes, equity is growing faster, um, but uh, it's this very sharp hockey stick pattern. In the euro area, it's uh, actually even more dramatic. We actually see uh, a declining assets. And for other European banks, we also see um, uh, this hockey stick pattern. Now, um, Partly this is due to low profitability, but if you look at the dividend payouts, uh, this is a topic that Jeremy mentioned earlier in his, in his uh, keynote, the dividends have been pretty high as well. And I think he here we have to look at uh, uh, things like the book equity ratio, the, the, market, to book, uh, the market to book ratio, where it is, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the marginal return uh, to the shareholders in just paying out uh, uh, equity can be higher if the market to book equity is below one. So what this means is that there is a limited capacity for the banking sector to uh, receive and absorb these hedging demands. And one indication of this is the deviation of 
uh, the deviation from covered interest parity we've seen since the crisis. Um, focus on the blue line, uh, because this is the average of uh, the deviation from covered interest parity of 10 major currencies. And the sign convention is that uh, if you're negative, uh, the dollar interest rate that's, in, uh, that's implicit in the FX swap market is higher than the dollar interest rate that's implicit in the money market. And what you've seen is that um, even though we are well past the crisis, uh, we have this very limited ability of the banking sector to absorb uh, these hedging demands. Now, how can we interpret this? Well, the way that uh, uh, we can interpret the, the, this, I think, is that the demand for hedging has gone up, and that's because long-term rates are low. There's a lot of uh, reaching for yield among portfolio investors, and there's a lot of international demand for dollar-denominated securities. But the supply of hedging services have declined because the banks are less able to absorb these, uh, these hedging demands. Now, it's true that central banks can inject liquidity and thereby, um, uh, thereby at least uh, uh, preserve uh, a tranquility in the capital market. But uh, occasionally, uh, we're going to see these patterns where the, uh, the high shadow price of balance sheet um, leaves the field to some leverage players who uh, may take on more uh, risk than, than, uh, than may be optimal. And I think the, um, I think one of the uh, uh, one of the indications of this might be what uh, we saw in the in the repo market in September, where uh, you, if you read the BIS quarter review, what we were saying was that uh, yes, um, uh, the uh, the shortage of reserves may be may be one factor, but it's also true that a lot of the secu uh, the, the treasury demand the of the treasury holdings were actually in the hands of uh, non-bank leverage players. And one indication of this is the, uh, the so-called cash futures spread, where uh, if you have a futures uh, exposure, that's a zero money down bet. It doesn't need balance sheet capacity to lay on that bet. But holding cash treasuries needs balance sheet. So if balance sheet um, costs are, are high, uh, you'll see a spread between the cash and the futures uh, yield. And this is the kind of thing that might uh, crop up when you have this combination of a high hedging demand and, um, uh, and the low uh, you know, supply of hedging, um, hedging services. So I think this goes uh, to some extent to what Elga was saying earlier, where you can certainly preserve tranquility by uh, providing... Uh, plenty of liquidity to the system in the, in the capital markets. But it doesn't mean that uh, we can uh, completely eliminate some of, these, uh, some of these tensions. The tensions will be there because we now have this combination of a banking sector, which, is, which looks pretty, uh, pretty constrained, uh, and the capital market, which uh, uh, is very accommodative in some respects, but maybe uh, less accommodative in other respects. Thank, thank you. So uh, I, the uh, decentralized uh, equilibrium where um, everyone uh, chose how to approach these questions, I think, worked out quite well. So we, we had a, a nice uh, discussion of the CCYB. Um, we, we uh, through Elga's contribution, the relative roles of monetary policy and macroprudential, which I guess follows Jeremy's uh, keynote beforehand. And uh, we, Hyun, uh, we, we've come to the... Uh, well, the banks and non-banks, and of course, one of the key uh, cross-border spillovers is between the uh, dollar market uh, and the euro market and uh, other FX markets. So uh, I think uh, one uh, very important point that came out was in terms of the timing of uh, when the CCYB should be, should be activated. And again, this goes back to Jeremy's burden of proof uh, earlier on. I can just tell you anecdotally from uh, the Central Bank of Ireland, uh, when we decided, we went uh, uh, to we chose a, a one percentage point CCYB, even though the it was super early in the credit cycle. I mean, basic credit was still shrinking, but the assessment was uh, we did the basic calculation. Uh, what's the problem of going too early versus the problem of going too late? And I think the evidence and the Central Bank of Ireland does a lot of published research on that. Is uh, it's not that. <laughs> 
the, the harm from going to early is, is not that much, you know, as uh, so long as you can uh, dominate your bank, banking lobby. Uh, with that, I think uh, it's be best to use the time uh, we have remaining to take uh, comments or questions from the floor for any of the panelists. So uh, may maybe after a day and a half of macro pre, you're, you're, you're uh, exhausted, but uh, please, Benoit. Something that uh, uh, already uh, Jeremy said and, and, and he'll stressed is that uh, next time we won't have all indicators uh, pointing in the same direction. Uh, at the current juncture, uh, one thing that the Fed is stressing uh, frequently is that uh, if you look at the household sector, they are consolidating, uh, you know, the balance sheet is improving. It has improved a lot since the crisis. Uh, if you look at the euro area, you see that credit is, is, is slow. So, you know, Jeremy was pointing uh, at uh, the relevance and the, the, uh, the quality of the signals that come from quantities. Uh, so, uh, if we look at the U.S. household sector, in the U.S. is still a relatively large, actually the largest economy uh, in the global economy, and, and the euro area is also uh, fairly large. Um, so, we can worry about China, uh, where credit is, uh, is still very fast. But if we think of these two places, uh, the U.S. And, and the euro area, we really had, and the signals we have from quantities, are, are, are really mixed in the case in the, in the US, and in the case of the euro area, it's mixed as well, because you have some countries where it's fast, other countries where it's not fast at all, uh, it's, uh, and, and the debt to GDP ratio is, is declining. So actually, uh, uh, is, is the Fed too complacent to, to reassure themselves with the, 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 the fact that the household balance sheet uh, situation is, is improving, uh, or... Um, how do you want to weigh the signals that you have from the corporate on the one hand and the household sector on the other hand? Oh, okay, Let, let's gather a few comments and questions and then I'll come back to the pa panel. <laughs> Please, Charles. The best idea that I've heard in this conference for dealing with crises is to limit the amount of dividends that can be paid out. Now, what I want to ask the panel is, how easy would it be to introduce dividend restriction mm -hmm. under such circumstances? OK, and maybe if we take uh, one more question before I turn back to the panel. Okay, uh, <laughs> we won't insist. Uh, so, so let me turn in order. So, Anil. Um, okay, on Benoit's question. Um, so I think it's helpful to think about the debt service ratio, uh, both for the corporate sector and for the household sector, is the thing that you're trying to, to manage on the borrower side. So imagine you've got um, a tail of highly indebted households or firms and what you're worried is they're going to, the households will delever and cut their spending, even if they don't default on their loans. The businesses will stop investing, and you'll get kind of a aggregate demand uh, feed, feedback into the economy from, from these defensive actions. So I think a good way to think about this is to just look at how, how the, the tail of the highly indebted people look, and then to try to do some sensitivity analysis of how much would interest rates have to rise or how much would incomes or uh, earnings have to fall for you to go into the danger zone. And so if, if you look at the, the Bank of England FSR, we have numbers like that. And at least in the UK right now, the household sector is, is relatively safe. I mean, debt service ratios are incredibly low by historical standards. It takes something like uh, 150 to 200 basis point increase in interest rates with no um, growth in income just to get you to the average level. I, I don't know what the U.S. numbers are, um, but I, that's that's the way I, I think about that. 
On Charles's point um, about the dividends, I mean, one thing that you see when you look at these stress tests is you hit these minimum distribution rules that, that automatically shut off dividends. And I think that's a, a good thing. Um, after Hyun and I wrote that paper in uh, February of 2008, we actually had an op-ed that was in the Financial Times saying they shouldn't be allowed to pay dividends. Uh, it didn't get any attention, but I, as, as a tombstone, I'm glad that we, we wrote that at that time. So it, 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 may be, it may be challenging. I do think one thing that you get out of the stress test is you train the supervisors to have conversations with the management of the banks about the idea that you might force them to shut off dividends. And so one kind of carrot versus stick thing is that, at least in the UK stress tests, if the firm has an announced policy that says we will slow down dividends, we give them credit for that so that that, that counts towards making sure they stay above their minimum. Now, I don't know to what extent uh, investors take heed of that, but I think that's a, that's a good policy to try to train them to say, if you'll pre-commit that this is your policy, then you're going to get credit for this and you won't flunk the stress test. So I, I don't know if it'll work, but at least there's a little bit of momentum in that direction. Just one last thing, I want to just endorse what Vitor said, which is buffers have to be usable. If this stuff's going to happen, you can't say right at the time of uh, the crunch that you're never going to release the capital. If you do that, you've defeated the whole point. So I think that's every time anybody in a policy position that's setting a buffer talks, they should remind people the buffers are there to be used. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Neil. Vitor? Yes, uh, thank you. I, I will uh, just address the question by, by, by Charles uh, on limiting uh, dividends. Uh, well, in, in the present situation, that would be difficult to have such a policy across the board, let's say. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, and I would prefer clearly in this situation just to be possible to increase the CCYB in preparation for uh, the future. Um, but it, I point out, uh, as Neil already started to point out, that there has been a change in treating and calculating what is called in the legislation minimum distribution, uh, distribution amount that the banks can really distribute. And initially, in the uh, European uh, legislation, in the CRD4 uh, and CRR, what is defined is that for that calculation, the operational limit uh, was just pillar one uh, capital ratio. But since 2015, pillar two has been added to it. So there are more limitations were introduced since uh, 15 uh, uh, to uh, these minimum distributable amount that the banks can use. So that uh, mitigated uh, a little bit uh, the possibilities of, uh, of uh, dividends uh, distribution. Uh, but I think that uh, to address the second part of the second question of the organizers, which I had no time to address, but now very briefly, uh, <laughs> taking advantage from your question, I don't think that the, uh, besides the CCYB or something of that sort, uh, the, the priority as I see it is not so much to increase regulation on banks, but on non-banks. Uh, because what has been happening is that uh, to also use one of your uh, sentences, regulators have forgotten about the boundary problem. Uh, so it's all about the banks, nothing about the non-banks, which are growing in terms of assets much more than, uh, than, than the banks. Uh, to give you a number, 2007, the total amount of uh, assets under management by investment funds of all types was 17% of total bank assets uh, in the euro area. Now it's 44%. There are valuation effects here, but nevertheless, uh, it's a big st uh, structural change. And nothing is being done there. Uh, uh, in 2015, uh, the ECB published a you know, public opinion saying, well, we need to have mm, permanent minimum uh, margins and haircuts, uh, both uh, uh, on uh, applying them just to uh, uh, secured financial transactions and also to, uh, um, to derivatives. And, and there must be also, there should be also a time varying component in that that the authorities could use in order to correct the pro bias uh, 
that the market introduced in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, calculating and applying margins and haircuts. Nothing has happened. The recommendations of the FSB are very mild and soft and very vague. Um, and the same is true about the FSB recommendations regarding asset managers in general, also very vague, nothing will happen there. And in Europe in particular, uh, there has been an increased mismatch between the maturity of the asset side of uh, all investment funds and the maturity of the liability side. So the mismatch is, has been continuously increasing. And there are no tools in the hands of the supervisors. The tools that exist in the law are to be used by the managers of the funds themselves. Uh, so uh, um, there is here a lack of uh, dealing with this question, which, that's my final thought, uh, contributes also in a, this environment to undermine the franchise of banks. And uh, with the uh, meaning that, in my view, regulators and supervisors must not ignore the fact that the situation of the banks in Europe. If you read the latest uh, financial stability review of the ECB, the picture is dire because in the baseline scenario, uh, the ECB is projecting a decline in the next two years of uh, ROE of banks in the baseline. So it's dire and the situation that exists is not totally uh, created by things outside of the remit of regulators, supervisors, and policymakers. And so part of the situation of that environment for banks is the responsibility also of authorities. And I think it's <laughs> time, in view of this situation, that the European authorities wake to these, uh, to these uh, problems of all the environment that now surrounds the banking sector in Europe. Uh, thank you, Vitor. Alga? <laughs> Yes, um, just to coming back to uh, Benoit's question on the indebtedness, I agree that at the macroeconomic level, it is not particularly worrisome, at least on the household level. Um, there might be some concerns at the corporate level um, in terms of how quickly indebtedness increases and also what the money is used for. Um, but I do think we also need to sort of um, go more into the details and look at some individual market segments or uh, lending segments and um, sort of look more at the uh, distribution because while on average it might not be an issue, there might be tails uh, or segments that are actually more of, a, of an issue. And um, yet all in all, at the moment, uh, financial vulnerabilities, at least in the U.S., on our estimates are well contained and as a result uh, a recession indicator that we have built that sort of maps uh, recession probabilities based on financial vulnerabilities so to some extent different than uh, metrics based on yield curves or um, uh, activity data is still um, pointing to a, a much more contained recession risk than what the consensus is currently forecasting uh, for the United States. What worries me a little bit, though, is that our financial conditions indices, which have been pointing to a material improvement in financial conditions over the last nine months or so on the back of the dovish pivot by central banks led by the Fed last uh, much of this year, is not getting any traction really into better economic dynamics. In fact, now by now, um, the economy should have picked up based on the uh, material shift in the monetary policy stance, and that's not happening, and it's not entirely clear why that is. Yes, uh, some of it could be the trade tensions in Europe. Also, some of it could be the fact that we are at a very low interest rate level and that the side effects um, are building, even though they still not outweigh uh, the measures taken. Uh, but there's clearly something going on. And to some extent, that worries me that financial conditions are easy and the, the, uh, the stimulus doesn't find it into the economy. Uh, so that could also potentially, I think, speak to some uh, vulnerabilities building up. Thank you. Jan? Um, let me uh, 
address both questions at the same time, actually. So, so, so Jeremy uh, gave us this very insightful um, pairing of quantity indicators and price indicators. Um, I wonder whether we are currently at a time where those two indicators are pointing in different directions. If we look at this chart, the quantity indicators are actually uh, very far from flashing red because uh, at least in terms, of, um, in terms of bank lending, at least in the US and the euro area, we don't see very much. But in terms of the price indicators and uh, the deterioration in credit quality, uh, I think there are, there are uh, several indicators that uh, credit quality is deteriorating. Um, I mean, that, this is not to deny that uh, outside uh, those countries that suffered the brunt of the crisis, we've seen uh, debt continue to go, uh, um, it grow very fast. Uh, so uh, in, um, in those countries that didn't really suffer the, the worst of the crisis, we've seen household debt now uh, continue to climb. Uh, in many emerging markets, that's true. But certainly for the US, Euro area, UK, those countries that really suffered the brunt, these two signals are going in the opposite direction. Now, uh, what about Charles's point about what if you just stop dividends? Well, um, I haven't shown you the dividend chart here, but dividends have continued to flow quite, uh, uh, at quite a pace. And if you think about it, this is, uh, think about Tobin's Q. Um, if you pay out your book equity, you get one dollar or one euro. Uh, but what do you lose? You lose the equivalent of one uh, share in market value. So if the market to book ratio is less than one, you're better off paying out and liquidating. Uh, and so it's, it's going to be very difficult to uh, just uh, require by diktat <laughs> that you will not pay dividends because it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to uh, um, make that consistent with the, uh, with the incentives of the banks. And I think this is where possibly... Uh, we need to be thinking a bit more imaginatively. So um, I think um, uh, in the sense that we may be in a situation where the, the old rules of thumb, the old rules of thumb that worked before the 2008 crisis may not be uh, the right ones to look at right now. And we should be looking at, I think, in my view, uh, I didn't have a chance to go through the, um, uh, the, the swap charts, but we should be looking at the capital markets we should be looking at the international capital markets in particular and the role of exchange rates. And I'll say a bit about this in, in the session tomorrow after Kristen, actually, in the, um, in the, in the session for Benoit. Okay. Th thank you. So let me thank the panelists. I think it's a very interesting panel, and the event reconvenes at 4 p.m. Thank you.